There's a great paper that was written uh, back in 1907 by a geneticist on this issue. Does the behavior of chromosomes explain Mendel's laws? And it does. So Mendel's first law is that if you have two alleles, two members of a gene pair, when they segregate into the gametes, one goes into each gamete. That's Mendel's law of segregation. So half of the gametes from a heterozygous big A, little a, will carry the A allele, and half of them will have the little a allele. So this is the law that allows us to predict what the genotype ratio should be in the offspring, and that allows us to notice any deviations from that genotype ratio. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit here to Punnett diagrams. Just make a note in your head that this fact of segregation is the basis for our being able to predict what the offspring will be like if we know what the parents are like. At least it's part of it. So if you have two heterozygotes who are mating with each other, so the male gametes have either big A or little a, and the female gametes have either big A or little a, it is Mendel's law of segregation which tells us that we can expect those gametes to be equally likely. The probability is 50% in each case. When they then come together to make a zygote that's going to grow up to be the offspring, then these, we just multiply these probabilities together. So 0.5 times 0.5 gives us 0.25, and each of these kinds of zygotes is equally likely, 25%. However, there was a reason that we wrote big A and little a. If big A is dominant, that is, say it's brown eyes, and little a is recessive, say it's blue eyes, and remember our baby with issues, then the ratio here is three to one. That's only true because it's three to one because in these three cases we have a big A, and in this one case we don't. So the ratio is three to one. It was this observation of three to one ratios in the offspring of heterozygote crosses that caused Mendel to postulate the idea that, hey, some genes are dominant and some genes are recessive. If a gene's dominant, you can see that fact in the phenotype. You can see that the allele is present in the phenotype. If it's recessive, you can't see the presence of the gene in the heterozygote. Its presence co is covered up by the dominant one. Mendel's second law. What happens when there are, we're looking at two genes and they're on different chromosomes? Well, Mendel's second law basically says that the events that occur at the different chromosomes are independent of each other. So genes that are sitting on one chromosome are going to be assorting independently to genes that are sitting on other chromosomes. So in, in this picture, you can see that if we have big A, little a, and uh, this would be a big A, little a heterozygote. This is a big B, little b heterozygote. They are depicted as already having been copied, okay? So the, they've been duplicated so that they can start going through the process of meiosis. And what's going to happen is that we're going to pull them apart. We're going to make four gametes out of each of the chromosomes. This combination, where you get A, B, big A, big B, and little a, little b, is just as likely as this combination, where you get big A, little b, and little a, big b. Okay? So that's tracking what happens when you have genes on two different chromosomes that are forming gametes. That's Mendel's second law. So meiosis is capable of producing genotypes that are different from the parental genotype. I'll pause for a moment there. I'm not just going to keep running through this slide because I want to tell you that this is the essence of sexual reproduction. The fact that the offspring gen genotypes are different from the parental genotypes is the essential evolutionary fact about sex. It can be achieved in a lot of different ways. But it means that sex produces offspring that are not copies of the parent. They are all different from the parent. 
And there are two genetic mechanisms that do it. I just showed you the first one. If you've got the genes on different chromosomes, they assort independently. If they're on the same G chromosome, you can have crossing over. Okay? So crossing over means that chromosome parts are exchanged during meiosis, and it produces new combinations like this. It's easiest to show you just with the diagram rather than with words. So when we've made the copies of the chromosomes and they are lined up, I think this is in prophase one, if I've got my phases right in, my, in uh, meiosis, it is possible that there will be a break and then a rejoining at a certain spot, and this will be done where the DNA sequences are very similar. So the chromosomes can break and be rejoined, and the product of that is gametes that are different. These are recombinant gametes generated by crossing over. These combinations, this kind of genetic variation, is something that's going on in every generation. The estimate for the human genome is that actually in order to go through meiosis, there must be a crossing over event, and it is thought that every human chromosome experiences one crossing over event every generation, roughly. Probably true for most organisms. So these things are continually being shuffled. And the point of that is that there are two mechanisms of recombination. Remember this. Okay? When we say that the genes recombine, they do it both because the chromosomes get shuffled and because there is crossing over. The crossing over generates new combinations within chromosomes, and the chromosome assortment generates new combinations within the genome. Both things are going on. Now, mutations are also going on in every generation, and they produce changes in DNA sequences. Some of them make genes that are functional. Some mutated genes have improved. Many don't. Many have worse function. A lot of them are neutral. And it's mutations that occur in the germ line, that is, in the cells that will form eggs and sperm, that get transmitted to offspring. They have evolutionary significance, so they change the information that's transmitted over evolutionary time. And mutations that occur in somatic cells are the things that lead to cancer. Cancer is a mutational process, and every cancer is a little evolutionary process that occurs just within the lifetime of the person who has it. Ultimately, if you go back through the history of life, mutations are where all genetic variation came from. So it's important to understand basically what's going on here. We refer, on the one hand, to point mutations. That's where you just change one nucleotide, and there's a category, there are categories of point mutations. You can have substitutions, you can have deletions, and you can have a deletion of an entire codon will not cause a change in the downstream amino acids. So if you take out three nucleotides at once, there won't be any change in the coding for the remaining amino acids. But if you take out one or two, you're shifting the reading frame. So if you have a deletion of one nucleotide or two nucleotides, it changes everything downstream from that point. So one or two deletions can have really big effects on the information content of the whole genome. We call those frame shift mutations. Mutations also occur at higher levels. You can have chromosomal mutations where you delete an entire gene. So if I say we delete B, I want you to think now that we're taking out maybe 3,000 nucleotides. The whole gene disappears, everything from the start codon to the stop codon. We can duplicate a gene, so we get two copies, or we can invert them. These are very important evolutionary processes. If you duplicate a gene, you can use the old copy to keep things working while you innovate with the new copy. So gene duplication is really important. Your genome has been completely duplicated twice. We can see that in the Hox genes. You'll see that in a few lectures. But in the course of vertebrate evolution, once back about with the hagfishes and the agnatha, and then once between the agnatha and the higher fishes, 
the entire genome was duplicated. And it is thought that this duplication of information may very well have been associated with the fact that there was a radiation and a generation of a lot of morphological complexity. Because we had duplicated the entire library. You could keep one of them going to, to keep everything running, and you could use the other one for innovation. So duplications are important. 